All right, my name is Young, and we're happy to be here to talk about my progress at Arizona State. Arizona State has one of the best power programs. So I hope yeah, I can give you some good insight about how we look into renewable energy in Arizona. Today, I'm going to talk about the short AI for um, decarbonization. You may say, oh, AI anywhere. Anything you want, you put plug in uh, AI. No, that's not the case. Here, I put the assured AI. I will explain why. Because you cannot say you put the AI and it's not working, then it's not working. You want to make sure when you plug in, it has a confidence. For example, if you have a nuclear power station, I definitely want to get the number 100%. I don't even want the 99%, right? One person, we are dead. So that's really crazy. So I want to talk today about yeah, a high level idea. I know you are coming from different backgrounds. A high level idea, how we can look into deep neural network to assure we get something that is structured and very much confident. So over here, I give you an overview, decarbonization, what, what is that? We have so much solar here. Yeah, I took a Uber, it's Tesla car all the time <laughs> from yesterday to today. So you can think about solar to be there, right? Uh, at your home, maybe on roof of some electrical vehicles. And then you have electrical vehicle charging. You may say, we, we have that already. But you know, you only have 20%. If you have 100% of electrical cars on the grid, you know, crazy people charging, discharging, try to do the demand response, then we may not have the grid ready to do the job. You may say, hey, young, you, you have Department of Energy. Didn't they give you some money to make the infrastructure super robust? Yes, they did, but it is not scalable. Yeah, look into here. This is a yeah, data visualization from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have different data points from smart meter, solar panel, electrical charging station, yellow, and then phaser measurement unit, very expensive device, yeah, green only two. <coughs> and you can see at a remote area, the color, I mean, it's weight. That means you have less absorbability there. Let's say you are meaning there, you are there, and your power quality is really bad. What will you do? Right? You complain. So then I lose my job as a power engineer. Now, if I look top down rather than bottom up, what we have nowadays is we have a power grid that is centralized. Like I'm the system operator, I control what is very good in San Francisco, in Palo Alto, maybe in Phoenix. But Think about the countryside. For example, for the students here, if you are living far away, maybe you do not have a, the same infrastructure like what San Francisco has. Then you can have some sensors, uh, the same as the middle part. Sometimes maybe your sensor is very sparsely located. If you go all the way to the other countries like uh, South America and Africa, so maybe this is dominating their scenario. So how can we ensure renewable is scalable Right, scalable all the way to the corner. So that's my job. Maybe not for San Francisco, but yeah, to make it everywhere in the world. So the trouble is we do not have sensor. Then how can you do the control? Right. Then this is what I am looking into. I say, I have electrical vehicles, I have electrical you know, airplanes, I have electrical or electrical ships. That is for the transportation, I have critical infrastructure different buildings, yeah, Department of Defense. And then we have the smart home for the students over here. Can we do something that we do not need to wait for 20 years or 100 years, years until every corner on the earth we have the meter to see before we do the control? So that's my focus. But when you come to that part, you have another question. Uh, what is the tour? Uh, Yang, you said AI, right? I guess you will have the AI as the solution. But how can I trust the AI that only has one eye, but he can control a large grid freely? Of course not. But that is what, why I want to talk about. Right now, what are we doing? We are the human, right? We look into the AI, we say, explain, right? You try to step up the voltage to make the power grid more sustainable. Explain why you want to start up, step up the power voltages. But later on, Maybe I'm not asking the robot anymore. A robot is talking to another robot, say, you explain to me. I mean, they don't even have the same language, I guess, because they are different vendors, maybe Tesla versus another company, right? So they need to talk to each other. Then how can one artificial intelligence agent understand the other? 
after that, let's say 20 years later, AI is so amazing, right? We trust them. And then suddenly I'm a power engineer in my operation room. The AI is the boss. He said, Yang, you go there, try to trick the line. Okay, I go there and trick the line. Then the boss may say, Yang, I don't trust you. You are human. Human are prone to errors. So you can see, I'm inversing the logic. The AI may need to trust human as well, right? We are not in the same language. And finally, I close the loop. This is very similar to what happened in the past 200 years between different countries. Human tries to understand each other. How did we do it? And that may be the path to go to understand how we can let AI to talk to human as different races. What do I do? If I go all the way down to logics, number one, I need, I need a guy to think critically. It should not be a yeah, supervised learning alone, right? Do the training, do the testing, overfitting, all that. Second, he needs to think far away. For example, I train a KI agent in the United States. When I move it to Africa, it's very different. Can he adapt and do something amazing? I mean, with the same performance? Maybe no. So he needs to diverge the scenarios he probably expect in the future. Third, we need to let them teach to each other, right? So I don't have time to maybe run my code from time to time. If you took some machine learning classes, each program is different, right? You have a course project, you have another one, you are very tired, but there's another one with even bigger data sets. So I hope that they can teach each other too. Finally, in order to make the communication sustainable, I need them to have a logic. Yeah, for example, Google has some research, uh, oh, is it Facebook? But anyway, yeah, the robot is talking to another robot in a language that human doesn't understand. I don't know if you hear that news, then yeah, they shut down the computer. So yeah, we need them to have a logic to communicate to me. I get up, I'm hungry, right? I eat some food, I'm thirsty, I drink some water before I go to school, then I'm very energetic. So that is very important for humans to understand them. So to put the human into the loop. But that means we need to first do the theory. I will have some light introduction. And second, we need to build technology. I will show you some demos to make you exciting. Third, you need to have field validation, right? Big enough data set rather than some simulation that you did on your computer. Finally, we need a policy. We need some gov government agency to say, what should we do to ensure these are followed by all the companies simultaneously? All right, now I'm going to the second part, which is the main part. After this lecture, as long as you can remember these four yeah, right points, I'm very happy. So critical thinking, build a logic, divergent thinking, structural teaching. Yeah, how do you do that with deep neural network for power system? And this is what I'm going to say on the high level, and please remember this picture. Number one, uh, you can think this as a black box. Now we have the input, we have the output. For example, you try to do a linear regression, regress your input, which is your controller, to the output, maybe it's the performance of your system. Then what I'm trying to do is I say, robot, split your logic, split your learning experience. Try to explain as much as possible. If you cannot explain 50%, then try to explain 45%. But try your best so humans are in the loop. Second. When you say you get up, you are hungry, right? You say next step is to eat a burger. So then I want you to tell me when you eat a burger, that means one hour earlier, you were hungry, right? You need to have a logic, go forward and go backward. Third, when you feel hungry, you eat a burger. Then when you are thirsty, will you drink water? When you're energetic, are you going to have a football game? So please tell me that you can divert to another scenario that I never told you before. And finally, you are the learner in the past maybe three tasks. Please try to tell me you can teach like how I teach you but by separation, by inversing the logic, and then going to different scenarios as much as possible. Then it's sustainable. So now, regression, if you took machine learning 101 or data science 101, or even linear algebra, so maybe you will learn this list of squares. So last time, Ali Abu from Northeastern North gave a talk on state estimation on fault analysis. People will see the same. You have an input, which is voltage. 
You have out, output, which is power. You try to learn this physical law. Remember, if I know the law, that's infinite amount of data. I don't need any data because I have all the data. I can change the input from negative infinite to positive infinite, and I can get the output 100% accurate, much better than AI agent. So that is our goal. We try to learn the power flow equation, but it's hard, right? Think about you have two sensors in the network with 100 members. It's hard to know who is connected to whom in what parameter range. But anyway, we try to learn this when we have so much unobservability issue. So this is my example. This is a network. So in this network, you have many different renewable penetration, some solar generation, somebody who doesn't have a solar panel, somebody who participated in the demand response program. But you can see some of the nodes are white. You don't see. Then how can you make sure you control some nodes over here? And everybody here is very happy with your controller signal. Maybe I'm super unhappy to make my voltage to be bad all the time. But then this is how we do the job. One, we have a physical system. Alia, who talked about the physical system? This is power flow equation. Then we pop it up. Say, hey, um, I don't know your system information, but I know your historical data. Can I use the historical data to recover the physical equation? Think about it. Right now, you are in front of me. Right? Let's have a magic. You disappear. And then I get all the data before today about you, like where you play, the game, <coughs> where you have the yeah, cafeteria, where you go to the classes. Can I create a digital twin based on the historical data of you? Do you have a virtual machine here? That is the magic of data science. And then we pop it all the way to the upper part. So we have our visibility, but that's okay, right? You cover my face, you still see there's a young over here. You can say, young, go there, right? I follow your instruction. Do you really need to see before you control? Of course, there's a tolerance, but that is how we pop up the information to do the machine learning. All right, a little bit challenging, deep neural network. So each box over here is a deep neural network. If you are familiar with um, some Google application, some Amazon application, they try to generate fake images, like uh, maybe for some very famous people. So they put two neural networks there. One is to generate the signal. The other is to say, hey, is this the famous guy? Yes or no? And then they train. They also do the autoencoder. They try to ask, hey, can I compress the image to the smallest and then recover it after the while. So this is the autoencoder. But if you look at all the famous architecture in machine learning nowadays, they just manipulate the different boxes to represent different functionalities that we are asking. They don't use single neural network, they use multiple. All right, they are more over here. Then I am thinking, well, for my power system, for the energy system, can I do the same? You can see they don't use 1,000, they use about two or three. Then I'm starting from two. And this is my yeah, method to separate the parts humans can understand and the part we cannot. Uh, I try to use the example in your brain, right? In your brain, they are left and right. Some of them is very good at linguistic part, analytics, and logic control. The other part, imagination, art. Then what are they doing? They, they are trying to divide the functionalities to different users. On the other hand, if you look into some biology articles, they say they are talking to each other. They are not staying apart from each other. They are interactions. For example, if I'm doing something over here, there are some echoes on the other side. So what does that mean? They divide, and then they come back together to collaborate. So that is my philosophy. I want them to collaborate Right, with each other, hey, let's do the job together, but internally they are competing with each other. I'm the best, you are not. So that is how I build two neural networks. Why is trying to learn the physical exactness? I try to put some kernels like quadratic function that I know. I try to put some semi-soidal function, you know, the waveform like the power signals. I say, hey, try to learn as much as possible. On the other side, I secretly tell another guy, please try to use any method you can think about, of course, neural network, to infer based on the input voltage, what are the output? You can do any decision tree, logistic regression, anything you can think about. And in the end of the day, I will ask them to come over to me and say, hey, who did a better job? So that is my design. 
So this one get a National Science Foundation career award. So they think this is idea to ask them to collaborate and compete and to split the information like a DNA into yeah, two different parts and split them in. So then the knowledge is like divide and conquer, divide and conquer like dynamic programming that you may learn in the past. And this is, yeah, maybe you say, oh, yeah, that's useless to me, it's power. But what I want you to understand is in the future, you may want to do some network. You don't need neural network all the time, but remember, try to divide your learning process into different functions. Some of them may be about symbolic regression. Some of them may be universal approximation. Some of them may be minimax gain so that you achieve your goal. But of course, you don't want it to be too large like this one because it will lead to overfitting, too complicated model. But this is the high level structure I want to tell you. Now I go to the second part, inverse. When I'm hungry, I eat a burger. When I eat a burger, that means I was hungry one hour ago. Okay, so that is the logic I want to inverse. But there's a trouble. For example, we are learning from, I was hungry and I, I eat a burger. You probably didn't find all the information to be contained. Maybe you eat the burger because your friend asked you to eat the burger with her, right, with him. So maybe some of the information, side information who are surrounding you, is there anybody forcing you to eat the burger is lost. Then when you're recovering the logic, then you have the wrong inference. And you say, oh, I was hungry one hour ago. Then I said, no, it was not true. Your friend asked you to eat together. You see? So then I have an arrow when I do this forecast. So what can I do? So this is the idea. You can use neural network again, but don't use it brutally. I use the neural network only in part of it. For example, when I say eat a burger, I split the information into two parts. One part is go to neural network, let the magic box do the job. The other one, I say, hey, let's follow some simple linear regression to have a controllability. So these two paths will be added up. I also have a side information over here. I say, hey, is there anything else that you didn't tell me? Right, this will come to you. If I design such a structure, I can immediately use mathematical algebraic equation to say, I can invert it with one-to-one -one mapping yeah, without any information loose. What did you learn? You learn again, structures, right? You ask the neural network to do something specific that you can not learn, <coughs> but try to also have other environmental factors to control so that it's not going to overfit. Then you get one-to-one -one mapping. That's very critical. Any question before I jump to the third and last one about splitting the information, inverse the logic of, of burger and hungry? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there an example for like what the burger might be an analogy to in the power system? Like what would you want to inverse? Right. Yeah. Burger means power. I mean, in my domain, I, I, I will try to make it better. And then the voltage will be you are hungry or you are hungry. What does that mean? Think about it. If you have the voltage set up, right now we have so many power electronic devices. I remember um, 80 years ago, I invited Georgia Tech professor Devon. He said, put my magic box here. Everybody will be happy. He, of course, he's trying to tell people how his box can do the job, but he controls the voltage. And once you control the voltage, there's a voltage difference. And you know, current go from the higher voltage to the lower voltage, right? So that is the causal relationship, starting from voltage to the power. But of course, you can have another one. You say, I first tell him that I'm going to consume five units of power. I just put my computer here, consume five units. I don't care what's going to happen. Then people try to adjust their voltage in order to serve you five units of power, right? But if they don't serve you five units of power, there's something bad to your computer, but you don't know. So that is power quality issue. We can have another lecture. I can talk to you offline to have more synergy. Divergent thinking. Sorry. Yes. I had a question in the inverse learning section. Sure. Uh, just a clarification. You mentioned uh -huh. that you included linear regression with neural networks to prevent overfeeding. Right. And why specifically linear regression? Why not analog? Right. You're right. It's actually symbolic regression. As long as you have some feasible understanding, 
then that's good. If you learn machine learning, you typically learn lasso regularization. Regularize, so it's not going to overfit. I use linear regression to make it easier because I know students are coming from different backgrounds, like policy, like the first department. So yeah, that's the reason. But as long as you have symbolic regression, you can use um, anything, quadratic function, sinusoidal function. You can even use lasso to penalize the parameter range and the parameter numbers. Mm -hmm. So those are, yeah, the regularization that we can introduce all the time. Okay. Right. And I can talk to you more <laughs> later. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Good. Okay. Divergent thinking. I put you into Africa. Can you still do the good job like Stanford? Maybe not. <laughs> However, we can try to ask the agent to do the same. Yeah. For example, uh, maybe this is a little bit going beyond um, the normal requirement of this class. For the fake image, I try to ask you, hey, generate 1,000 images. And then I try to compare, oh, this is uh, the famous guy, maybe young. Oh, this is not young. You try to say, hey, you generate the wrong thing, regenerate. So these two guys are working together to generate a fake image. So that is the mechanism of GAN. However, you know, there's no control over there. Maybe generate a dog image, but the dog is very similar to Yang's face for some reason, right? Just a happy dog, or maybe a human dog. Then these two agents cannot know, right? This is because they only do the supervision. They didn't know the mechanism that Yang should have two eyes that is this far away from each other. But there's no rule to regularize. Then how can we ensure this is a human image? Right? This is what I did. So I said, hey, generate, right? Generate anything. But I put a controller here, right? After you generate an image, I will immediately look into the eye and say, hey, this is a human eye. This is not some rectangular eye, right? So this generator in power system this means a quadratic function. That is what he was asking, right? I tried to put the regularization over here. I say, when you generate the information, don't generate the voltage and power simultaneous. They are rich information inside. Generate the voltage first, and then use quadratic function to let it go to power, and then use the voltage and power together for your final image. You can think it in this way. Originally, it's generating your image of your face. Now what they are doing is the first generate your maybe uh, maybe your eye, and second based on where your eye is, my controller will generate where your mouse is, right? And then I try to compare. So then at least I can ensure your mouse is below your eye rather than sometimes the mouse go upper yeah, than the eye. So that is the neural network design for physical gun that I did. Yeah, the mathematical stuff. Um, Let's go to the last one, structural teaching. So far, we asked the robot to separate the information so I know he's not doing some illegal stuff to me. Second, I asked him to inverse the logic so that he has self-validation mechanism, or I have the validation mechanism to the robot. And third, I asked the robot to be flexible so that he can handle a lot of jobs that I never trained him. Finally, I want to give myself freedom. I want to give him freedom. I said, train your friends and do the job automatically. I'm going to sleep. So that is the last piece that I'm going to talk about theoretically, and then I'm going to show you some demo, nice demo. Over here, this is all electrical um, and navy ships. So you can see there are some circuits over there, some propeller, some generator, gas generator. Maybe you can put a nuclear generator when your ship is super huge. But what people are asking us is, can I send the ship to the ocean, to another country, and stay there for maybe a season? And then I will not dispatch anybody to maintain, or maybe when you are damaged, I, I cannot send anybody. Can you sustain? So that is what we try to train. One of the robots to be super robots, I send it to maybe um, California coast, I send it to New York coast, I send it maybe to Southern Africa, but I cannot send all the ships anywhere. I train this one well enough, and then I say, Im immigrate your knowledge. How did you control your circuit so it's super robust? When you have some of the circuit that is bad, how you use the other part to maintain maybe the capability to come back to your you know, hub? So that is the transfer learning. Now the magic comes to the picture. So originally this is the graph. 
right? You see they are stretching in different way. What did I do first? I said, hey, abstract. I don't care whether you're a huge generator or small generator. I don't care if you are super huge robot shape or you are very tiny, abstract your circuit to some graph. Second, identify yourself. Where are the generators? Oh, I'm here, I'm on the north, I'm in the south. Okay, identify the load. You have a laser weapon, right? Oh, I'm here, I'm on the other side. Good, I know, property alignment. Third, please try to reshuffle your network so you look similar to each other. So what I did is I tried to put the red in the middle. I tried to put the blue that is kind of aligned with each other. And finally, I said, trim your network. I don't want to see too many because I know people are different. I just want the core part to be exactly the same as my original design. Then I transfer the knowledge. Okay, and then you can go back to your original network. What did we learn here? Structure, right? You try to design your physical system with a structure, and then if possible, put the neural network in a similar way so that in the end, you can transfer the knowledge with confidence. If in the end you cannot have this, maybe this is one node, one node, one node, then you transfer nothing, right? So that's the balance, how much you reduce and how much you transfer. All right, mathematical part to show that I'm a professor. <laughs> Sorry for the next five minutes. So we define a graph. So this is going to be the vertical nodes, the nodal part, the edge, and then this is the data. You can think about it, this is like a, you have a graph. You have some maybe young sitting here and a node, and then I connect there, I have an edge. And then over the time from one to capital N, I have different motions, sensor remember what I'm doing. And then, I have my source grid, that is maybe power grid in California. I have my target grid in Arizona. Then I try to ask them to talk to each other. I say, in California, I have five years data recording all the critical events, too much solar, too many Tesla cars. Now, Arizona, five years later, you are going to face the same. Can you learn from me? Then transfer the knowledge there. What I do is I try to define the measurements, the X, the Labels like who you are, generator, maybe a <coughs> small um, vehicle. And then I ask you, how did you connect with each other with a cable or while it's charging? Ask them, um, yeah, what is your graph label? Are you normal of normal? So these are the matrices that I design. After I design the basic properties for each machine learning method, we typically have a regularization, we have a minimization or maximization. So this is my target. I try to have the transfer component analysis that is achieved by a trace design and the regularization. I know it's hard, just remember this part. I try to make the parameter to be limited. I don't want you to tell me too many. I, I don't care what you do every day and every hour. Tell me something rough so that I'm not going to overfeed. And second, over here, if the K is the kernel, I try to ask you, what is the data? Is it data voltage, yeah, and power? And then uh, arrow, okay, um, can you do a kernel? You say, what is kernel? The kernel is the trick. If, for example, you have two components in California and I have two components in Arizona, but maybe here, this is a big generator and a small car. There is a small generator and a big car. So that means I can now transfer easily. I need a kernel to blend the message, to do some normalization, right? To try to make a, Nonlinear relationship into a linear relationship. So that's the kernel part. And finally, I have my parameter to feed the data, which generate the kernel, and then I try to do the weight. So in summary, I have the source domain data, target domain data. I try to say go to high dimensional space so that you are linear. And once you are linear, learn the mapping, then do the latent space learning, W and the kernel. And then I add another one. Yeah, this is our human bias. If you learn machine learning, there's a hyperparameter. In Bayesian theory, there's a prior distribution. So that is what I put here. I say, I have some knowledge what you do. I don't want you to start from zero. Put some prior information here. What is the priority? What is not the priority? And then yeah, the steps, I 
start with a random work on the graph. Or you may say, what is a random work? And random work is try to explore. I try to explore, can I go there? Oh no, okay, try to explore the other part. Oh no, then I try to sense what is surrounding me. Second, once I have a good understanding what is measurable, what is transferable, I try to make it concrete, fix the kernel, who to go to what high dimensional space, and then learn the parameter, finally, put my buyers, I'm the instructor, right? I have some privilege to define some buyers and then do the regularization. However, at the end of the day, this paper doesn't work out. My students spend 10 days and the simulation is still there. You can think about it. This is very realistic, too much data and too much yeah, differences between different data sets. And then my student observe, what can we have? We don't have random signal in power domain, right? When you have a line trip, it's, it's shut off, right? Something is going down immediately and all the signal is the same. Going down and try to oscillate. Then they are the same, right? The only difference is the mean and maybe the fluctuation, tendency and pattern. But most of the time they just go here, go down, oscillate. So that means I don't need to learn from the beginning like 1,000 people, 10 million people together. I just need to remember what is the difference. Everybody has two eyes. I don't need to yeah, care about the eye. Maybe behavior differences is what I'm trying to learn. So that is what we try to say here. Different signals are very similar. It has its own classes. Then what we do is we try to coerce the learning. Yeah, for example, you have five generators here. Right? And I have seven. I'm proud. I have more generators. I don't care. Put one generator to aggregate what you have. That's enough. I have five loads. I have my Tesla car, <coughs> my electrical. I mean, I have a laptop. I, you have five. I have seven. I'm proud. Huh? I don't care. Condense it to one. Right? So this coercing stuff, make it abstract and condensed, make the learning much more efficient. And yeah, this is the idea. Finally, validation. That was coming. So before I show you the demo, I want to show you how we do the coding. For the coding part, you may say, just use Python, yeah? In my class, I try to download a tensor yeah, package. I try to download um, yeah, some PyTorch. It's wonderful result, good or bad. I can tell you for one hour. What we do is we know that is true, but for power system, you need to code once, right? When you go to the water system, you code another time because our signals are very different than each other. When you go to the transportation system, you code for the third time. So this is quite inefficient. So what we did in this platform is we try to <coughs> propagate, I say, okay? Just tell me your graph, tell me your input and output independent of the domain knowledge. So this is what we had. We have the simulation layer. We we'll try to define the graph objective. And then we have a network redistribution model. So anything coming from the application, I say, refresh. Go all the way as easy as the graph that is over here, many graphs. And the other graph, I do the Python graph, the editing, I do the graph replication, right? You have one power grid in California. I have 10 transportation systems in Arizona. Do the replication and handle all the machine learning part already, and finally go back to your application layer. So this means uh, our code can do more than one application. This is a data set, and you can see Department of Energy send a lot of money yeah, for this type of analysis. So this is easily $20 million. So look into the data, what is the utility, and try to visualize how the data recovered from each other and do the machine learning. This is a picture I showed you, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this is New York. Pittsburgh is to the west, Pennsylvania, in the west of the Pennsylvania part. And we have some big data partner. We visualize them, do the data cleaning, and then learn, transfer. This is a software that we did for Avery. Does anybody know Avery? Oh my god, Avery is here, Palato. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's the best uh, research institution for electrical yeah, power. I'm sorry, nobody knows that, but yeah. So they invest a lot of money to my group. So then we do the machine learning part, nearest neighbor, naive base, decision tree, logistic regression, support vector machine. 
hybrid method. Um, and then you can see we can do detection. We can tell you where the yeah, outage is happening on your solar panel or my solar panel. And then I can tell you what's happening is burn or maybe it's short circuit. So we can, yeah, I can show you them now. So this is a software. And uh, yeah, typically we load the information and then we pre-process the data. So that is in the graph layer. And then we try to get all the sensor loaded over here. And then we choose the method for this regression. And then we do the event type analysis. And then the signal is coming. And you can see here, we have all the information over here. And now let me show you a streaming part. So this is a signal from OpenPPC. You can think about a signal from a real device. This is our platform. Right. Okay, so over here you can see the signal starts. So from one computer, and then there's a lot of oscillation. And the reason oscillation, yeah, over here we know it's noise, so we didn't do much. We just try to extrapolate the lower frequency signal. And then it's getting up, still noises, but suddenly it's getting to the right signal, then we yeah, conclude it's time to pick up the signal. So you can see this is a fork, something bad happened. The voltage dropped from 114 something to 114 something but lower. And then you go up to the next cycle. And then you can see we have some detection. What year, what months, what happened? What is the reasoning? And what are the places I need to dispatch an engineer like down to the field to do the repairment? And now I'm going to finish my talk quickly. How much time do I have? Is it all the way to 30? 17 minutes. Right. Okay. 30, 30. 30. Okay. Well, I'm using horizontal time. Yeah, we are on the track. Where's my slide over here? This is another one that we did for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We try to load the data from the field. And with the data, we try to learn what are the mapping rules, right? V to P, then you probably get some conductance. You get some maybe connectivities. Then we use that to connect all the information together. The CEO said, this is the first time you look into the secondary, like how people are connecting with each other. He is very happy, but you know, what did I do? I just load their data, do the learning, and then reconstruct the information. It's very cheap. That's also how you can be a billionaire. I mean, not me. I need a lot of software engineers to do that, right? Coding and then put it into the utility and then load all the information. Then they know where to repair their solar panels. This is my lab. So yeah, this is an electrical engineering lab. We have uh, protection devices over here. You can see there are some many transformers. These transformers are mimicking San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. So there's a triangle over here. And then I have the conductance. You can see the yellow one. Right? This is very expensive, but we <coughs> mimic the conductance between the two cities. And over here, this is the this is a place where we trip or make an event. Sometimes we need a yeah, we have a fire alarm because it's burned. But anyway, we try to trip a line to say maybe a, a tree is touching the transmission line, then it's burned. But anyway, the system is um, connected, then voltage will have a cascading failure. Then we have the protection device to make this connection here and there so that it is perfectly maintained. Have the ORT, you know, this is just a small system. This one is a hardware in the loop system that can scale. It has circuit inside by like FPGA. Have a real solar panel connected to the utility. And then, yeah, this is a panel, solar panel, right? Have a micro -group. And this is our validation. We validate on actually systems of people on different continents from Europe, so from Asia, they can understand what we are doing. And then I try to do the testing on small cases, eight buses, maybe eight students here, and 123 buses, three times of the students here. I also try our algorithm on the utility data set, put it into the utility. I show you guys the big map, remember? Question? No? Okay, sorry, so there's a question. And you can see that yeah, for our method, there are four observable parts, partial observable part and unobservable part. Four observable part, you can think about the place in Las, 
Las Vegas, San Francisco. So there, um, our master, I mean, physical master, like the old master is good. They don't need me, right? They fire me. They say, yeah, you are originally is not even as good as ours, occasionally. But what you find is when it is partially observable, the, the old master does not work because they always ask, how are they connected? Tell me the transformer location. So in this case, you can see our method is working very well. This is like a, yeah, 0 0.01. I can do all the way to 0 0.008 for the error, 20% of error reduction. All right, before I show you the conclusion, let me do another demo to you. And then I'm open to the question. So this is a platform that we did for the whiskey touch. It's much cool, cooler, much more cool, cooler than the previous one by my group. This is also visualization. You say, you talk about machine learning, but at the end of the day, what can I see? How can I make money? Well, first, you have username and you have the password, you log in. And then you visualize your grid. The grid has different sections, different colors. You can have layers to look, right? If I'm an engineer, I'm in control over here, I focus more over here. Then I have different layers to show like uh, what are the voltage issues, what are the maybe um, outage issues. And I can look into different topologies so that yeah, the AI driven method is going to expand layer by layer. So it's like the AI is assisting me to look into a grid in a much better way. Yeah. And then on the left hand side, you can also look into the equipment generator, maybe a capacitor band, or maybe a load like a Tesla car, or maybe power war, or maybe some verge devices. And then you can look into the load information. You can look into how the power is flowing virtually when you do not have enough sensors. And this is coming from three um, feeder. Um, and on the right hand side, I can also visualize GIS information. If you have Google Map, right, traffic, traffic layer, maybe the um, skeleton layer, right, maybe the virtual layer, you can choose how you visualize. We can do the same. And then you can also look around. On top, you can choose the time. You can also try to look into maybe the voltage average, average over the day, or you can say maximum. Like this is some basic data analytics tool. And then you can look into the phaser, phaser A, B, or C. This is critical, like how you plug in your big load onto your grid for sustainability. And then you can also change your time and day so that you can look into the future and also look into the past. All right. Now I'm going to conclude and give you time to question me anything. So today, what I showed to you is we want to have a decolonization as soon as possible, at least my hope. For that, we need to put a lot of renewable energy yeah, and power electronic devices. For that purpose, we will have more components that was never in the grid before. And what we are targeting is 100% electrical you know, energy transportation. With that, we get a lot of data, but we also get the trouble on the edge of the grid in some remote area when the sensor is damaged, when the data has communication error, when the computer is not working locally, then can I still maintain electricity stability everywhere? You may say, yeah, I don't care as long as it's not my house. It does matter. Right? Think about it in the past. There's a big generator. You are low. You are bad. I shut you off. Right? Two days later, I pay you $10 and reconnect you. I apologize. I give you a coupon. But now, there are many mini generators in your home and in the other homes. You are supporting each other. If you are out, this can trip another outage. And then it's like a blockchain. Right? It's going to have a chain rule. So then it's going to have a cascading failure in a wide range. That is why we pay so much attention to have controllability, even on some remote area. And that is why AI can pick in and to ensure the scalability with a cheap solution. So yeah, I hope with what I explained today, you are partially convinced that yeah, this method can help the decarbonization. And I'm ready for any question here. Yes. Uh, so I'm not familiar with the background, but I know that okay. it's possible with enough generators that you could have like an islanding effect. So like, right. you know, the grid is massive, but if one severed, it's possible that that severed portion is still generating power. Yeah, that's right. Does, 
would just be able to address that or manage that island. Oh, that's good. Why, why should I address that? Like a hospital, right? When yeah, you take me, he tried to isolate himself. So the grief here is that um, he can still do operation for the patients. So islanding is not bad all the time. Sometimes it's good. You know, when you are talking about islanding, I think it is more like, um, you know, I, I, I work with utilities. I want to do some maintenance. For example, they are rich people. They bought a lot of Tesla cars. Then I need to change the transformer. Otherwise, I cannot support enough current to them. Then they are going to complain to my boss that I'm fired. But then I go all the way to the substation. I try to do the operation. But you know, I actually cut off their power. But it's still energized. They create an island. They have their power war, Tesla cars. So then I'm that <laughs> I'm energized and then into the hospital. So that is a bad case for islanding. Yeah. So it depends. But yeah. good question. Yes. On one of the last slides, when you had the metrics for like your neural net versus other implementations, what was the MSE, MSE measuring? What was the actual part? Oh, this is mean square arrow. Mean square arrow there, we were measuring the mapping root arrow. For example, I'm mapping from V to P. When let's say it's a quadratic function, V is one, P is one, V is two, P is four, V is three, P is nine. So quadratic function. Then I try to hide it from the AI agent. People use the neural network to learn the same. Maybe when you put one, you will put negative. One. You put two, he will not put four, you put five, right? Then there's a mismatch, right? Then I use five minus four, put a square, so it's positive. And then I try to minimize the error in my algorithm. But in the validation, I'm trying to estimate how long is the AI doing the mapping rule learning in square arrow for the yeah, yes, regression. So what was the actual output of that? P. What is P? Power. Oh, oh. Right. From V to P. You, of course, you can change from P okay, to P. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Right. Square root of P, I and mean, sometimes it's V, right? So then, yeah, I try to isolate. I say, everybody can do the mean square arrow estimation depending on what you want to estimate. You can also estimate the fourth, right? Whether there is normal or abnormal. Then, yeah, that's another metric you can do. Thank you. Yes. When you were talking about coercing the learning process, and you mentioned the node aggregation part, right? Uh, you mentioned that that reduces computing time. Yeah. But does that also increase performance? Um, it's very similar to regularization. In your training, it may not increase the performance. Oh, the training arrow can be bigger, mm -hmm. but it is more towards the testing arrow, especially when you are isolating the training data and testing data with the validation data or vote to separate. Yeah. But the arrow can go up and go down. Our theory here is yeah, when you are going to some operating point far away, this coercive method can make it much more robust. For example, right now, let's say voltage is 110. And then 10 Tesla, car, Tesla cars comes over, then my voltage drag all the way to 90. So the system never saw that in the past. Maybe it's crazy, right? Then my coercive method may have a categorization to say, oh, 90, don't worry. I will first scale it back to 110 and then do the normal operation and then scale it back. So that is the coercive part. Try to approximate the unseen scenarios to something you saw in the past. Mm -hmm. And I'm more used to working with simpler networks, but right. why don't more traditional regularization methods like LC or L1 and dropout were used? Were they not like satisfying enough in this case? Of course, right? If they are satisfying, then I lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> so L0, L1, and L2, they are to some typical programs, yeah. something in the class, right? When I am talking here, it's a challenge that we are looking to have a genius data set. If, for example, when you are doing the training, did you consider two different types of network and you need to do the transfer? Probably not. You focus on one data set, maybe hospital data set, right? And then say, look into the image in the brain, he's sick or not sick, but the input is the same. It's a 64 by 64 images all the time, mm -hmm. right? But what I'm talking here is you are trying to change 64 by 64 into 1,000 by 1 million. You can see it's not only going big, it's also reshaped. So that is what I had over here. It's a transfer learning that does not have much consistency. And that's the challenge. Don't, I cannot use AL0, right? I yeah, yeah. use the last yeah. parameter. It doesn't make sense. You need more parameters. It's a bigger network. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Right, Jay Wang. Hi, Yang. 
for your PME. How do you? Okay, let me read loudly. Hi, Yang. Great to learn about your work. For your PMU work, how do you make decisions on whether and where to dispatch crew if you find anomalies? Let me thank you, JY. Mm -hmm. Depending on the PMU number, if I have only one PMU, then I can only tell you is it to the east or to the west, right? I can only tell you a region. I cannot tell you, oh, it's there. You only have one sensor. So what we do is we try to divide the system depending on how much, how much observability you have, right? So first one is to the east, to the west. If you have 10 sensors, I can put 10 corners. I say, oh, this is zoom one, go there. So if you have more PMU, then I can narrow down and send the crew more accurately to the field. So yeah, depending on what you have, the AI will also adapt to find the location. If you have measurements everywhere, then I can tell you exactly next to YPD2, that red, 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 red place. Yeah, that's my answer to JY. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. About the Kitachi video that you showed at the end, right. you mentioned uh, that you can also add GIS information into it. Right. Is that only for visualization, or can also these GIS, GIS data during reporting be used for other purposes? Yes, yes, it can be useful. Because let's say um, I try to identify a solar panel. I say, who has the solar panel? Because somebody, yeah, there are people in some states, they do the solar installation, they don't tell the utility for some reason, maybe for economic reason. Then you want to find the solar panel by Google Images. Then what we do is we look from Google Images and try to say, oh, it's there. And then the solar panel you cannot find, right? It's a very cheap solution. So this is one application. GIS information does matter. Second, if I want to, for example, let's say you get $1 billion tomorrow, right? You try to buy some yeah, fancy cars. Then I need to understand how your house is connected to which transformer. Then GIS information is very important because your house is not going to connect to some substation in New York. Right, so then I will actually not only use the latitude and longitude to have the Euclidean distance to help me decide who is connecting to whom. I sometimes even use the curvature of the Google map. For example, the poles typically are on the road, right, to the two sides of the road. I try to calculate you know, this curvature, how this is going to grow like a snake. Right? So that information is also one kind of GIS, like how people construct the buildings and the paths in the past. There are more, but GIS is definitely something important because we are living in a 3D place. Right? That's our environment. It's like a free sensor. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>